Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so sorry we had some technical difficulties with, because of which we got locked out. Uh, we are back. So I hand over to Professor Gurudas now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let me just quickly recap whatever we've done earlier, right? So we stopped here. We said that today's objective was finding customer value beyond products. Okay. So, yeah, so I was talking to you about this book on, by Dan Brown, The Inferno. Okay. Now, 30 years back, if I wanted to buy a book, what I would do is walk down to the lane which has all bookstores in my city. I live in Pune, and we've got an area which sells a lot of books. Okay. So maybe I'll just walk up there, pick up the book I want, and then come back home. Zoom fast forward to about 10 years ahead, so which is about in the 1990s to 2000. Along comes a web, uh, along comes a store, which offers me a lot many other things. It offers me nice, comfortable atmosphere first. Of all. Then it gives me some amb ambience, and then it has an air conditioning. I can sit around in that bookstore for a while, order a coffee, check out which book I want, buy it, and be done with it get home, sit down with my coffee. When I bought this book last month, I did it in none of this. I did it on Flipkart. Think about what is changing in these three situations. When I was buying on a road or maybe in a small bookshop about 30 years back, I stopped doing that and I started buying in a more comfortable atmosphere in a bookstore which is selling the same book and now today I'm doing none of that and I'm buying from the convenience of my house. We'll come back later to what, what is changing in these three situations. Let's look at another product which has uh, taken my attention recently. The ready to eat meals. You see them all around in almost all supermarkets, right, these days. You walk into a Spencer's or a Moore or maybe even your Kiranawala store or your mom and pop shop around next door. And you will see a lot of these ready to eat meals which just need to be taken home, boiled and eaten. Now, when one of my friends five bought it last week, I asked her these three questions. Did you buy it because it's more nutritious? He said, no, certainly not. Okay, and did you buy it because it's more tasty? Again, the answer was no. Oh, well. Then did you buy it because it was cheaper? She says, no way, this is far more expensive. We are spending money through our nose to get these ready-to-eat meats. I was wondering, how come these products get sold when there seemingly is no value to the customer? Let's get back to it a little later. company called cleantokri.com. This is a very small startup. I mean it's no longer a startup now. I think it's more than five, six years old. It's a Pune based company started by a person who's got a software firm. It's located in a very upmarket area in Pune called the Korega Park. Okay. It's, uh, it's a lot of foreigners and this back living around that place and generally the society there is uh, uh, what would be classified as a very upmarket a1, A2 kind of socio-economic classification, people living there. So when Green Tokri started, they started by selling fresh salads. Okay, so they had broccoli and they had lettuce and they had Chinese lettuce and what sort. All these sort of names which I can't even remember now. I keep eating them once in a while in one of these Italian restaurants or maybe one of the other restaurants or even when my wife gets it at home. But generally speaking, you get the idea what I'm trying to say. Five years back, Green Tokri put in a web model. So people who were working in far out IT areas, you know, Pune is now spreading like crazy. So we have to travel 20 kilometers on any given day to reach our place of work. So not everybody lives in Korega Park and then you're traveling to Magarpatta city and Vimar Nagar and Hindiwadis and all, all these places which are very, very far away. There's about 20, 30, 40 kilometers from each other. So when you get back in the evening, the last thing you want to do is go out and shop for cabbages and lettuce. 
agreed to agree said, why not send us an SMS and we'll deliver what you want to your house. Okay. Think about this model. Do you think Green Tokri makes money nowadays? Green Tokri is rolling in cash. Or look at these two websites if you've used them lately. The one on the left is called Airbnb, which is uh, a bed and breakfast service. And the other is a TripAdvisor. I'm sure most of you have visited TripAdvisor. A lot of people I know these days have visited TripAdvisor, right? So let me start by asking you these questions. Why are these va businesses valuable for customers? I mean, they don't sell better products, right? You would, you would buy the same Dan Brown Inferno on the roadside or in Crossword or on Flipkart. Dan Brown doesn't write a chapter extra when he sells on Crossword or he doesn't write in better grammar when he sells on Flipkart. So it's not the product that I was after. Or think about the ready to eat meals. There's nothing different, right? They're not nutritious, not tasty, not cheaper. So what the hell is the value proposition for customers or green tokery? I mean, I can as well walk down to the corner of my roadside and buy all the fresh vegetables. So why do I need to pay all this more price for somebody who's an IT background entrepreneur and is, has a web commerce business and I know he's got higher operating expenses yet I'm willing to pay him a premium and buy stuff from him. Oh, why do I go to TripAdvisor? Something is changing in the market and that change is the value proposition for customers. Now as a good entrepreneur we got to seek out sources of value from customers. Let's take the example of the Dan Brown book. Okay, There are two broad sources of value which customers can get. The first one are the value propositions coming from his product needs. Product needs are all about what I want with the product. How do I want that product? How should it be? How? What should there be in it? All of that. And then there is a host of value coming from a lot of non-product needs associated with that. So do you think Flipkart was offering me a different value in the product need? Or was it offering me a different value in the non-product need? Look at the product need. In a book, I like to have the author I want. I, I like the book to have a good binding. It should be long lasting. It should look good in my library. Yeah, I mean, I should get the feel of a book. I don't want to read on a Kindle. I'm one of the senior types, so I re I'm not really from the digital age. Or I maybe I need a good typeface, or maybe I need a good styling. Maybe I'll choose a book with a hard co hardcover binding and something which is um, good to look at. So these are all my product needs. Think of it. Nothing is being touched of any of these things of the product by these three vendors. So the shopkeeper on the road, nor crossword, nor flipkart. They are doing nothing with the product needs. What they are doing is they are creating more value from me in my non-product needs. And my look at my non-product needs. How have my non-product needs changed? Today I want to review I want to read a review of the book. Today when I want to buy a book. I don't want to be stopped from buying a book at 12 p.m. at the night. I want to check out the options. I want to check out how can I pay. I also don't have too much time to buy. So if I want to go to Crossword today, maybe I'll have to take out my car through this rainy season, go down to Crossword, pay 20 bucks for that parking guy in the basement, walk up two floors to Crossword and then find out this book is no longer in stock. I'll have to come back and do the whole cycle all over again. Look how much cost all this is adding to me. And this cost is not coming from product needs. This cost is coming from my non-product needs. Have they changed over time? Most certainly. I, am, I want to buy at a convenient time. This is definitely some a new value which has come in today. I did not feel this issue 30 years back. Maybe I would have understood that I have to buy before 8 p.m. because otherwise the shops close not much time to buy, again something which is born out of today's need. So something that is changing is almost all in the area of my non-product needs. The non-product needs or the, these, these new businesses are creating a new satisfaction for me. 
remember I could have got the same satisfaction if it were the same book we're talking about from all three guys but no these guys are adding a new value to me when I'm buying this book it is not about new feature but it is about new value think about crossword the new value which crossword brought over to its customers was comfort and ambience air conditioning light music a lot of other things than books Maybe you could also buy a cup of coffee in most of the crosswords you can, at least the ones in Pune. Or you could buy a donut, stuff like that. You can sit around and gaze in that crossword for a long time and nobody's going to ask you anything. Was that new value which crossword brought over? Most certainly. And the guys on the street who were selling the same book at the same maximum retail price lost business. Why? Not because Dan Brown wrote different things, but because there was new satisfaction and new value which was being offered to customers. Today, I don't even want to pay for that. I don't want comfort, I don't want ambience, I don't want air conditioning, I want nothing of that sort. I want convenience. I want to buy at 12 p.m. I want to buy on Sunday afternoon. I want to buy with the credit card. I want to buy payment against delivery. I, I don't want to go out in the rain. I want to sit at the convenience of my house and buy. So what I'm doing today is I'm trading off all these values towards one simple new value which Flipkart is giving me, which is convenience. Think of it. How is your consumer changing? Or look at the ready to eat meals. We are trading off nutrition and taste with time saving. Or think of it from TripAdvisor. Earlier, when you wanted to visit Simla or Manali on a vacation, you would seek information by looking at hotel advertisements. We no longer want to we want to seek out how others have experienced it. So therefore we go to TripAdvisor. Look at this new value which is being brought into the same old products. Products are not changing. None of the products have changed which we are talking about till now. What has changed is this new satisfaction, the new value, not the new features. So why do we call these values new? Did they exist 20 years back? Did Maybe even 20 years back somebody wanted to ask someone else, some other tourist, how was this hotel when you, which you booked in Manali or how can I save time when I'm making? Of course, all these values existed, but look at the sources of new value. As an entrepreneur, it's far more important to step back away from products and first understand where all can the consumer seek new value or new satisfaction. In the five main areas are the changing macro environment. Now this is a completely underestimated analysis which almost all businessmen forget to do or a lot of books, textbooks or a lot of uh, seminars, they fail to sensitize entrepreneurs on what is changing in the macro environment. They make us look at marketing research. They want us to go and talk to consumers. They want you to check out the competition analysis. But there's something which you're leaving out of the table and that's the macro environment. Look at all the businesses uh, which have changed or morphed because of these macro environmental changes. Just take one change, the economic changes happening in your society. We're getting quicker loans, we're getting large credit facilities, we're getting long periods to pay off stuff. If you're going and buying at a furniture store, they're probably going to give you a long credit. If you are going down to your retailer to buy a consumer durable or an audio system, he's quite likely to give you a six-month payment terms. The economic situation in the entire country is changing. When you get your first job or maybe when you were married, would you do you think you would buy a one bedroom hall kitchen these days? I wouldn't. Well, none of us would, in fact. Today, we don't want those stingy, small, dimly lit, lit uh, kind of staircases leading to one bedroom hall kitchens. We want to live in a resort. I want a golf course. I want to look out of my bedroom and see a lawn. I want a swimming pool. I want all of that. The economic situation of consumers has changed so that the new value is coming from not from buying a house but for from going and living in a resort. Look at in your own city. In Pune, for example, almost all the housing projects are resorts. I see nothing short of resorts. 
Oh, look at the demographic change. Families are getting smaller. We no longer live in this place where we were born. This is certainly happening in a lot of places, right? So you were born in Jharkhand, or maybe you are living in Calcutta where you are living. Okay? You were born in Kolhapur, maybe you have shifted to Mumbai or Pune for your job. All this is happening. We are keeping back our parents, the grandparents are no longer with us, the flats are getting larger, we have a lot more money to spend on, we have a lot of entertainment. What we, what technology has created is, it has reduced our patience. We want instant gratification. Yeah. You know what is the cost of buying on Flipkart? I think the cost of buying on Flipkart is to wait for that one and a half days until your product comes. Because I remember as a kid, whenever I used to buy new shoes for my school, I went to Bartas, bought that pair of shoes, left my chappals in that box and walked back with the new shoes. We are still kids. We want to enjoy the products as soon as we have paid. Therefore, tomorrow a new business will come which will change the value proposition and Flipkart perhaps will no longer be with business. Okay. So look at the demographic changes we are having. We want convenience. We want speed. We want increased service demands. We don't want to buy a refrigerator. We don't want to buy a microwave oven in the store and leave it there and wait for the guy to come and install it. We want somebody to do it absolutely immediately. Even before I reach home, I want that. Plus, the amount of service has gone up. Cities are getting larger. Your average consumer is getting younger. Think about when you bought your first car. Think about when your father bought your first car. Think about when you bought a flat. Think about when your grandparents bought a flat. You are doing it at a far younger age. Oh, look at the socio-cultural changes which I am saying. I am sure you guys have watched for at least for some time this idiotic program on the idiot box called Big Boss or TV Roadies. Look at it. 20 years back, do you think these kind of programs would have worked? You, there would have been a huge hue and cry about it. We don't want a, a TV program which is bordering on almost something which is uh, sexually explicit okay, or roadies. Who would have wanted to see his friends being bashed up by this half crazed guy? But we enjoy it now. There's a dramatic socio-cultural change which is happening when we have started living alone, when we have started living away from our immediate society, when we have started living away from where we were born, where we, we are coming into completely new places. I look at the technological changes which are happening. Remember Meru Caps? I am sure most of you would have traveled with Meru Caps. Now when I am in Mumbai, I no longer want to hail that yellow and black cab which I lived with for the last three years. I want to call up a cab and ask for it when I'm stepping out of Deccan Queen when I'm reaching Mumbai. Technology has changed the, my satisfaction. I don't want to wait in a queue. I don't want to sit in a cab which does not have a con. I don't want to do all of that. I am ready to pay more for this technology. Oh, look at the environmental changes. Look at the gamut of eco-friendly products which have come up. Look, an entire industry called the organic food industry has now come up because of this environmental what is changing? All these things are changing in the, in the environment. Now, luckily for entrepreneurs, not everyone sees these new values and especially not the market leaders. Remember HMT? I'm sure you would have heard of a company called HMT. Maybe your fathers are wearing a, an HMT watch. And remember Titan? HMT was a market leader. It enjoyed a share of business which I am guessing would be at least about 60 to 70 percent. Amazing for a country like India where we had at that point of time we had almost about 1 billion people and then you had a 30 30 percent share of business is huge already. HMT had great people who crafted superb watches. They had good production technology. They could buy cheaper. Their economies of scale were absolutely daunting for any new. In fact, HMT was such a huge uh, competitor that nobody wanted to make watches other than maybe Voltas at that time was making watches and Alvin was making watches. Some other sporadic people. Along came Titan and looked at the macro environment. 
it saw that something was changing. What was changing? The economic situation was changing. Social cultural aspects were changing. People were getting much more independent. They were getting rebellious. They were get, they wanted to be carve an identity out of themselves. People didn't want to look at time. I mean, how many times in your life would you buy a watch when HMT was selling? At best, my guess is you buy a watch about three times. One is when you pass your 10th standard or your 12th standard. Second is when you get your first pay packet and you want to change your watch. And perhaps the third time is when your father-in-law gives you a watch in your marriage. Nothing other than that. Titan said that, look, this is not enough. I mean, people are not just buying watches. They're doing something else. Demographic changes, socio-cultural changes, economic changes. All this was saying that people are getting more independent. They, they want to carve an identity out of themselves. Why don't we sell them fashion apparel which they can buy, which would also show the time. So Titan never made watches. They made stuff, accessories, which you could wear on yourself, which also gave you the time. Now, how brilliant was that of a new value? Or remember Nokia and Micromax. What we are talking about is the leader may not be the best person to see this change in the value system. When Nokia, when Micromax came, Nokia was a market leader, almost a market leader. It had a huge business share. It was churning out products in India like mad. Along came Macromax and completely revolutionized. It saw what changes were happening in the macro environment, quickly put in products for that particular change, and then lo and behold, where are you today? Let's look at another example. We are still on non-product needs. We are looking at innovating from understanding your non-product needs. All these examples that we are talking about are in the, not in the field of innovation in product, but innovation in other things than the product. Okay. Technological changes in the macro environment. Dell was a startup too, right? Remember? And there were large organized players who were making hardware. So there was IBM, there was HP, there was Apple, there were so many others. Along came Dell and said that look, the macro environment clearly tells us that people are getting technologically much more read, well read, okay, or literate. So what do we do? How can we build value in a non product need? Why don't we allow customers to build their own computers? This was a simple brief which Michael Dell started with. And it started a big thought process. Dell changed their value proposition into buy something which we make to buy something which you want. And that kind of revolutionized that. Even today, Dell has a higher profitability than many other computer companies because you can actually pay for what you want. And think about what it does to the consumer. When I'm going to Dell's website and picking up things which I want, I'm actually making price less relevant. Why? Because I'm only picking the stuff which I'm ready to pay for. Amazing. That is where the value to customer is coming from. Dell consistently has got a higher customer retention, higher customer loyalty than most other people here. And in the process, what did Dell benefit? Was it only customer loyalty and customer benefit? No, certainly not. It actually, Dell benefited far more on uh, profits than anything else. Simply because, look at how the existing hardware players did business in the industry. This was the sequence. So they designed a product, then it called for stuff, they assembled the stuff, they supplied the stuff to distribution channels, then the marketing and sales team would go out and get the orders, then you deliver the material, and then you serve the customer, and that leaves you with margins. This model is no good for Dell, because we are assembling on our own, right? We are choosing on our own, right? Sorry. We are, uh, assembly is still done by Dell. Okay, so what Dell had to do is reorient what we call as a value chain for this particular delivery of value. The first is they also design products, they have inbound logistics, they have sales and marketing before assembly. They have assembly after the product after the order is placed. They have a direct delivery. There are no channels. This is eliminated. And then they serve the customers. It leaves them far higher margins. Can you think of how the where the higher margins are coming from? When I ask this question in class or with entrepreneurs, most of them say is 
what they say is that you eliminated the distribution channels and all that margin which you gave here are coming here. But finally, that is not the source of profit for them. Look in this industry. This industry, the later you buy, the cheaper you get. Okay, which means Dell assembled late. They came from falling prices. The other important thing is while HP and IBM had a lot of finished put stock which remained unsold, there was absolutely no finished put inventory with with them because unless you had an order, you would assemble it. The third most important thing is in an industry where you you paid after 30 days, you are collecting advance payments. As soon as you have assembled your own computer on the screen, you take the payment and wait for the delivery. Advance payments collected and of course low channel cost. All this meant high margins for Dell. Look at the innovation where it is coming from. Dell did nothing with computers. They did not invent the core 2 do or the core 3 or whatever you have. Okay. Dell just did something in the value chain which was bringing value to customers. So let's take a look at the modern consumer. How has he changed because of all these uh, changes in the macro environment which we have talked about? Technology. Nowadays, the consumer is always coming. He's far more social than you think. He may be sitting alone, but he's still very much social. In a lot of situations, he's more. Co-produce something with your colleague sitting in Brazil, for example. Or you would be sitting somewhere with your colleague um, uh, sitting in China. Okay. Co-productiveness is increased because of technology. We see it in academics. If I'm writing a research paper or if I'm doing some research, maybe I'm doing with uh, doing that along with the person who's working in a US university. He no longer needs to be my colleague. He can be sitting thousands of kilometers away. Or look at the cultural changes. We talked about individuality. So people, you and I, I want to be far more individualistic. I want people to remember me. I want to be experiential. I want to go out and find out why this is right, why this is wrong. I want to do it on my own. I don't want to be told by people saying this is right, this is wrong. No, I want to experience it. I, I'm rebellious. If 100 people on my street have bought one computer, uh, I don't want to go and buy the same thing. Maybe I want to do something which is different. Another thing which is coming up with culture, I start trusting strangers. Remember the TripAdvisor example? What do you do on TripAdvisor? You're believing what strangers are telling you about their experience. You have no clue who this Adrian underscore Goa or Tom slash Hawaii guy is, but you still believe them. You stop trusting advertisements. You start trusting some people you don't know, not even an acquaintance. That's how culture is born. Oh, look at the demographic things. We talked about your consumer getting younger, families getting smaller, living away from home. Comfort and entertainment are a large chunk of what you spend on monthly. So think about all of this. How can you combine this to give you new ideas for value proposition? Okay. Most of these earlier examples that we talked about are combining a couple of these things which have changed here. Yeah. Innovating in the changing macro environment, what do you do? List out the changes in your industry in macro environment. The best analysis. I'm sure you would know the best analysis. Just Google the word best and you'll get a lot of That's how you can do a best analysis. Political, environmental, social, technological, some people add legal and environmental also to it. It becomes best analysis. It's just simply a boundary list of what, what is happening in your industry. From this, try to figure out what does your new consumer look like because of these changes. Now, this requires some amount of imagination, some amount of discussion with the new consumer, some amount of uh, looking at prior research and things like that. What would be the new values which would be in consumer? Is it convenience? Is it speed? Is it increased credit? Is it uh, cross-cultural stuff? Is it some eco-friendly product? Is it an organic food? What would be the new value which you would be seeing? Products is already buying it. I'm not asking you to go and invent products. I'm saying do the same things but do it with the new values. The next step is capture the value in your business activities or your non product needs. Or you can capture the value in your products. Remember.
remember, you no longer go around town with a calculator, or you don't need a diary, or you don't need a Sony Walkman to record something, or you have all of that in a converged handphone. There are so many products which have been over the last 10 years. Can you converge a couple of products? First converge, product conversions I remember was something which was uh, innovated for the education sector. You know, the table and the chair converged into one simple device wherein you could stack up those chairs, give you a table, you can flip over that, you can write, you can go out. Look at convergence even, even in these simple products. I'm not even talking about technology. The next source of innovation which I want you to what which we will discuss is resegmenting existing markets. I'm sure you've heard of segmentation, right? But segmentation is nothing but creating smaller homogeneous groups from a very large heterogeneous market. So if I tell you to make a product which will please the entire country, it's very difficult. But if I tell you to make a product which will please people with an income of fifty thousand per month and age of about 35 to 45, then it will be much simpler way. So segmentation is a very well known thing and is already accepted in uh, all businesses. But there's one problem with segmentation. The problem is most entrepreneurs go by the market segments created earlier or created by their leader and they don't want to put any imagination or thought in research. But I'm saying we can look at resegmenting the market as a source of value for customers. I'll give you two cards. I'll, I'll show you this with a couple of examples. The first example is the mobile phone needs. When the entire industry was segmenting the market into business needs, entertainment needs, socializing needs, and price needs, along came Micromax and looked at a completely different segment. It said, let me resegment the market. I will not make a business phone because Nokia can make that better. I will not make an entertainment phone because perhaps Samsung can make it better. I don't want to make a socializing phone because maybe I don't have the expertise. Let me see what I can do. They picked up the rural markets. And in the rural markets, they said, we can make a product with only one feature. That's it. You don't have to innovate. You don't need R&D. You don't need nothing of that sort. So what? Micromax did was they made a product with a longer battery life because in rural India as you would know there are very long power cuts so and people travel a lot so I have to go from village A to village B to sell my wares or to buy something so therefore all this traveling means you can charge less all this power cuts means there are fewer times in the week when you can charge so Micromax made a product with just one feature very advanced feature they put it in was a longer battery life, and from that point on, after the simple resegmentation of the market, they completely changed their company. They morphed into what we of Micromax. Or even uh, think of how um, Eyeball. No, I I don't know if you've seen this product. This is made by a company called Eyeball. Now, this this company was never known to make any kind of telecom products till now. They used to make uh, computer mouse and trackers and stuff like that, you know, which, which generally is found as an accessory for computers. Along came Eyeball and said, hey, we know a nice new segment which everybody has forgotten to address, and that is the senior citizen. Look at this brilliant product which Eyeball has made. I think it's called Asan or something. I'm not really sure. I think it's called Asan. Asan as in the Hindi word Asan, which means easy to use. Okay. So they have large buttons, they have a very large display, they have an SMS button, they have a, I think they have a, uh, what is that, an alarm if something goes wrong, they have um, uh, easy contacts which you can store, they have a lot of features, they have a huge sound, I, I heard one person with, sitting with it and almost got scared because you know, it's, the, the sound is so loud. So this phone worked wonders for senior citizens, you know, people who had uh, short sight or people who couldn't hear, hard to hear, or people who just needed a couple of phone numbers, all of that. So Eyeball, a, a, a company which was not at all known to make any kinds of phone, is leading the senior citizen market with the phone and I, I expect them to work on a very high profitability because here's a unique segment, here's super value that they're delivering only by resegmenting the market and there you are, you get, uh, get to be the leader. 
of the examples which I've talked about in the uh, shoes. Now the entire shoe industry from Bata's to Liberty's and all these guys have segmented the market into formal wear, casual wear, sports wear and youth wear. That's about it, right? I mean, I can imagine that. Dr. Scholz is a, com is a US company which went and resegmented the market and said nobody is making shoes for uh, the physically challenged people. So you have one small problem, let's say no arches for your feet. Nobody has any kind of shoes for that. Nobody wanted to do that because these guys are so thinned out. I mean, how many customers would you find in a country like India who have got an arch problem? Very few, right? Maybe a few sporadic people in my locality, maybe something in some other area. They're all scattered all over the world. But Dr. Scholes created these stores or, or you know these places where uh, they displayed all these products for the physically challenged people. And people actually came down to buy this Dr. Scholes. So what I'm saying is you can look at resegmenting also, also uh, uh, from the perspective that what have these large people forgotten about? Okay. So they may have forgotten a senior citizen market or they may have forgotten a physically challenged market and things like that. So this is another very classic example I always give of, re of resegmenting the marketplace is about the car rental industry in the US. How would you expect the car rental industry, you know these budget rental cars and Hertz rental cars and AVs rental cars, all of these rental car guys whom you know. How do you think they segment their market? I think they segment their market on business uh, customers, on um, vacationers, on um, casual users, one-time users, loyal customers, all these sorts of segmentation. Along comes a company called Enterprise and addresses the value proposition of a very small segment. What Enterprise did is it only addressed to the needs of people who had wrecked their cars or damaged their cars. So when the entire industry was talking about away from home consumers, enterprise came and said, let's make a product for close to home consumers. So these are the guys who wreck their cars in their home city. They are not traveling to in some other place. While most of the businesses of AVs and Hertz and um, budget is coming from away from home consumers. Simple resegmentation. Amazing value. And think about how they are going to add to their profitability. Enterprise did not have to invest in very expensive lease rental offices at airports. So if you are a close to home consumer, you don't need an office at the airport. You just needed to be on the phone. Enterprise was located in the cheapest part of cities, low cost of operations. Now if you are a close to home consumer, you don't need GPS navigation in your car. While the others provided GPS navigation, technological devices, all these stuff, you know, which they continuously had to update, enterprise cars had none of this. Low cost of operations, same rental prices, very, very convenient service. You pick yourself, your car, and are you um, giving your car for a repair which is 20 kilometers away? Okay, we'll come and drop the car there and give it to you. Right? Amazing value proposition, only by simple segmentation. Oh, this is a British. Remember Cadbury milk? Now this entire industry till about 20, 30 years ago, there was only one segment which they served. And that as you can imagine was the segment of China. Cadbury's sales were not growing. So there were some smart guys in Cadbury marketing. They said, oh, kya what, what do we do? Why not? Why only address the segment of children? Because there you're going to fight on supply, there you're going to fight on limited availability. There, the, your consumers, the, the children, are not going to be loyal. If there's a new taste around, they want that new taste. They don't want to stick around with Cadbury because they've eaten it for the last two years. <coughs> so the children market is not really attractive for chocolate manufacturers like Cadbury. Cadbury said, let's now stop talking about the conventional segment and let's talk about the segment which is which we have never thought of, which is the grown-ups. How can you make grown-ups eat chocolate? They are not going to want it when they are walking down the street or they are not going to want it when they are uh, uh, when they have a break in, in at place of work. They, they, they do nothing of that sort. But they are eating Nita 
on occasions if somebody passes or if you know something good happens or in Diwali and all of that. So they repositioned the chocolate which was for children into something which is for grown ups which is the Kuch Meetha Ho Jai campaign. So resegmented re the market and repositioned the product giving brilliant results. The growth of uh, over the last two or three years, uh, sorry, over the last five years of Cadbury has been phenomenal. Yeah, oh, look at this entire business, you know, Agarwal Packers and Movers. Now these guys were not even known in the country. Today Agarwal Packers and Movers are one of the largest players in the industry. This is also an industry which has come up because changes in the macro environment. So they said let's only target one segment which no fleet owners has ever targeted. That is the shifting. People who are changing jobs or in between jobs and they want to shift. So Agarwal Packers and Movers still has the highest profitability over other players. Sources of customer value, resegmenting. Okay. So what we talked about is find new ways of resegmenting. Go beyond the usual. Environmental changes create new wants, as we looked at earlier in the earlier examples, but they also create new segments. Now this is something which is important to realize. Shifting populations, changing occupations, you could also look at clone segments. So if you have been to the US and seen a few segments there which don't exist in India, you can bring that segment into our country and you know you can try to create products there. That's called cloning. You can also resegment with new technologies with conversion devices like we talked about. Or you can resegment by simply changing the existing focus. If earlier an industry was talking about price, you can refocus the industry into talking about some other feature which is more convenient. Or you can change the focus from one particular way of distribution to completely different way of distribution like it happened between crossword and flip card. Or you can look at uh, uh, um, uh, communicating about a new feature which uh, your computers have never done that uh, earlier. Okay, coming to a close of the session, sources of innovation, I want to give you the example of General Mills. Now, General Mills is a company which does, uh, which, uh, which is into the um, kitchen kind of, uh, which makes a lot of stuff for uh, kitchens. So they make atas and flowers and Pillsbury cake ready to make. Okay, they have what they call as the innovation intersection. They have a platform which connects employees with inventors, academicians, entrepreneurs, suppliers, customers and consumers throughout the innovation process. A brilliant way to connect. They get the kind of value proposition which General Mills has come up consistently with their last so many products is brilliant, amazing. And that's not because of searching for value in the research and development, not because of looking at product development but because they're connecting with academicians, they're connecting with suppliers <laughs> or customers and inventors, all of this. So think of something like that. Can you go down to your nearest B-school and connect with a fraternity, talk to them? Or can you connect with inventors in, um, in one of the national laboratory, maybe uh, national chemical laboratory if you're in Delhi, or um, some other national physical laboratory if you're in Delhi. You know, they have a lot of innovation and stuff. Like that. So uh, quickly to end the session, what we have discussed today to summarize is about finding new ways where customers come and seek value and these ways are not in products alone, they could be in non-products. So uh, coming to a close, uh, because we have a limitation on time and I need to close it, um, I, I'm, I'll be happy to take any questions if you have any. Uh, thank you, Gurudas. We'll start with the Q&A now. Uh, okay. Right. So, should I stop showing my screen or is this okay? No, I think it's okay. We'll wait for two minutes so that yeah, we okay. have all the audience get aligned with the questions. Sure, sure, sure. I'm okay. I hope we didn't have any technical glitches which people were able to hear what I was saying. Yeah, there was slightly a little mic. The Okay, so we have a first question from uh, Shishakant. He asks, how to validate new propositions? Uh, sorry, can you come again? What was the question? How yeah. to? Validate new proposition cheaply. How to validate new position? Proposition. Proposition? Cheaply. Cheaply. Oh, okay. okay. 
Okay, which means I'm assuming you have a couple of propositions and you want to check out which is the best one. Is that right? I think that that's yes. what we mean by that. Yes. So uh, uh, the best, best way to do that is what the IT people call as the sandbox. I think it's a small panel of consumers. Uh, the consumers who are going to be your sandbox. Yeah, uh, Gurugas, can you please come a little closer to the mic? We can't hear you and there's a lot of noise okay. because of the mic also. Okay. Yeah. Is that any better? Yeah, much better. All right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, I would suggest to use a strategy which the IT people call the sandbox. Right? What that means is, you know what kind of segment would be attracted to your products. So, catch a couple of people whom you know, typically from that segment. So, let's say about 8 or 10 or 15 people, more, more the merrier. They would be the guys who are kind of telling you, uh, giving you feedback and this is real feedback which you do. What you can do is go out and test your product features and the new value proposition which you're giving over the small closed group. Okay? And you evaluate them on rational thinking. Now don't, generally as a consumer we, we, we do a lot of impulse purchase. We don't always buy on rational thinking. But nevertheless, it's important to understand when you're launching a new product, it's important to understand the rational process which is going on at the back of your mind. Something is happening. The manifestation could be in an impulse. Okay? The manifestation could be with, a, in, uh, with an emotion. And yet, we are rational animals. So there is something which is happening rationally. So ask them to evaluate the product on rational grounds, on basis and then quickly sum up about what kind of features make sense to them. Now what I'm saying is this group may not really be representative of the population which you're looking at. So it's, idea, it's a good idea to have at least about three or four such groups of eight to twelve people who are going to help you out in a product design or value proposition. All right, our next question is from Anuj. Yeah, our next question is from Anuj Jahan. He asks, what are some of the challenges that startups face while resegmentating? Oh, <laughs> nice question. I think the biggest challenge is um, the bias which creeps in by looking at your competitors. Okay, so you're making a product and all you know is your competitors, five or six of them. And all you know is what they do. And what happens is you are kind of biased in your thinking when you keep looking only at your competitors. But that's, that's the reason why I always tell the students as well as the entrepreneurs is you must refresh yourself by looking at other industries. Now I'm sure none of you are from the industries which we just talked about, right? I mean nobody would be perhaps, I'm, I'm assuming, nobody would have something like a TripAdvisor, nobody would have a Flipkart and yet I feel it's very important that you understand how other industries have innovated. So that is the biggest challenge and people stop at that challenge saying let me look at my competitors and then I'll get down to business. Don't stop looking at your competitors. You've got to, you've got to let go of your competitors and look at other industries. Look for answers in other industries. Yeah. There is uh, uh, Sarthik is question? yeah Sarthik is uh, is giving his opinion so he just wants to ask you can he say that it is better to be the only player in a small market segment than being among the competitors in large market segment? Um, no, I wouldn't make such a large sweeping statement. Primarily because uh, let me give you the example of. Uh, the Colgate toothpaste dental cream market, right? All of us know that market, so I'm giving you that example. Colgate dental cream is perhaps, or was perhaps, the highest selling toothpaste in the country till now. Along came competitors, and they wanted to bite into the pie which Colgate had. So they also made all these products. Then Colgate said, "Let me resegment the market." So they made various segments. So they made a seg they, they saw a segment which was the sociable youth. Okay, all they wanted were bright teeth. All they wanted was uh, fresh breath. So they gave them the Colgate Max. Then they looked at the children. All the children wanted was maybe a cartoon character or maybe colorful things. So they made the Colgate children. Then they looked at the housewife market. So the, what is the housewife mainly doing throughout the day? It's worrying about his family. It's worrying about tooth decay. It's worrying about germs. It's worrying about all of that. So Colgate went and gave them the germy tech products. Gave them the um, you know the doctor kind of products which we see the added. Now, 
After a few years, people had stopped innovating in this. Everybody had all the products for all these three, four segments which we just discussed. And along came Colgate and said, here's a completely new product a segment, a very small niche, which is for people with bleeding gums. Now you would have seen on television and print advertisements nowadays a spurt of ads in this niche. When Colgate entered this market of you know the bleeding gum players, it was only the, the only company which made this toothpaste. And I'm sure it was the most profitable at that time. Colgate was selling its toothpaste at the highest price in that particular segment segment, while the mass market product, which was the Colgate Dental Cream, was the most intensely competitive market. Yet Colgate's profits were coming from the dental cream and its profitability was coming from the niche market. So I wouldn't make such a sweeping statement saying that uh, niche markets are better because if you see a niche market, so do others. And that's exactly what happened in the last one year. Today we see almost about 12 manufacturers who have made toothpaste for bleeding gums. Yep. Uh. Thank you, Gurdas. The next question is from Shruti. She asks, are we compromising okay. on certain values while innovating beyond product? Uh, compromising on health while eating ready-to-eat foods, you know, such examples. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, <laughs> this is something very important which I talked about, right, uh, which I didn't talk about is um, um, something I also would like to take this chance to say. There are some responsibilities of businesses and that should never be violated. So as a marketer you have five large areas of responsibility. The first responsibility is of course the economic responsibility that you must be profitable to your business. Right. So uh, can you all see this slide? Sneha, can you see this slide? Yes, 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 Gildas. Okay, I'm assuming you can see it. The second most important responsibility is the legal responsibility. You have to be within the law of the land. The third is the kind of question that Shruti is asking. Right? You, you have to benefit society in some way. So I will never advocate making products which are bad for health for consumers or something which is detrimental to your uh, social, social habits and things like that. The fourth is you also have to be ethical to what is morally right. Now remember the recent case which we read in the newspapers of Ranbaxy getting this huge fine slap from the European Union. Now Ranbaxy did not violate the first three. Ranbaxy was very within the legal thing. It, it also was within the social thing. But ethically is perhaps where they goofed up on. And that's the reason why they have to do what they have to do today. And the last responsibility I always say of the marketer is the ecological responsibility. You must respect the environment. You must respect that we are sitting on a planet with limited number of resources. They are going to get over. Do you want to leave some for your future generations or do you want to take out all the minerals and build all the products in your own generation? So uh, thank you for bringing up this question. Shruti. I think it's most important for us as entrepreneurs as well as um, marketers to respect, understand our five-pronged responsibility. I, I can never advocate violating any of these responsibilities or values. Yeah. Next question is from Nishant. He says, can you, "Can you see my screen?" Yes, we can. Oh, okay, fine. So let's go. All right. Our next question is from Tejasvi. Actually, he says, "Could you share tactics to differentiate a product in a highly competitive space?" like e-commerce? Mm, I think this question is not complete. I think you want to say something more because I, I really cannot understand how to reply to this question. <laughs> no, he's just saying that, uh, you know, if he if you want to start an e-commerce uh, site, but there are so websites. already, yeah, and, but there are already so many e-commerce websites running already. So what is that, how, ah. what, how can I differentiate my product? Is there anything that I can do? Right. So, uh, uh, intensely competitive spaces like web commerce and e-commerce are for entrepreneurs, I would suggest best left out unless you have some really innovative technology or innovative uh, intellectual property which you are going to build in. 
Otherwise, what is happening is you're going to compete on features, you're going to compete on price, you're going to compete on making the product better at a lower price. And what it is going to tell you is you're going to affect your profitability. And remember, the established players have got deeper pockets. So if you can do something better and cheaper, they will they can actually kill you by reducing their prices. This has happened in a lot of scenarios. I, I recently remember the case when I saw Nestle, what is that, Maggi sauce, right? I think Maggi sauce used to cost about 120 rupees a bottle of 1.2 kgs. Along came uh, Danone with a sauce which it's, uh, uh, which the bottle was priced at 80 rupees or something. I'm, I'm not sure of these prices but I'm just kind of trying to give you an example. Now Nestle saw this thing and they put a 40 rupees discount offer on all their bottles. Amazing, Danone couldn't match it. After one month, I saw a card of Danone come and pick up all the unsold crates of their sauce from one of our neighborhood stores. That's because, you know, uh, this price differentiation. So therefore, remember, in an intensely competitive market, unless you really have some sound value proposition which you can build on and which you can uh, which sustain on, I wouldn't suggest you to start your business in that kind of a field. Start somewhere which is a little less competitive. Start in a business which is a little towards a very niche market than a mass market. Web commerce is typically a mass market business. It's very difficult to succeed in mass market businesses. Yep. Next question is from, uh, sh yeah, there's another question from Shishakan. He says, your view on instant access to healthcare with the help of technology. He wants to know your view on instant access to healthcare. Uh, with the help of technology. System access to healthcare with the help of technology. I am, uh, 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 again, uh, you're not kind of telling me exactly what you mean by that, but uh, make a few assumptions. I think you were saying that if I can access my health records or if I can access some uh, um, pathological uh, statement very quickly. Uh, well, to me, it, at, at the moment, it seems to be of great value. But also remember the fact that a lot of inventions uh, have not seen the light because the inventors have gone and asked questions to consumers like this. Now this is, you know, consumers a completely stupid question. Now if I ask you, 30 years back if Robert Bosch would have asked consumers, would you like to drive a car which, you know, uh, does its own gear change? The answer would have been a resounding no. If I ask you today, would you want to drive a car which has a joystick instead of a steering wheel? It will be a most certain no. And that's because consumers can't imagine what inventions will be like. So if you have something which is some, something like an invention or a completely new idea in the healthcare space, I'm not sure you would want to ask this question uh, to consumers. Maybe you want to test it out on a smaller sandbox, like I said earlier to the um, uh, uh, person who asked me the question. Or maybe you want to uh, do a small trial run. But certainly don't ask questions to consumers like that. And it's very hard to imagine things. Very difficult. Our uh, last, yeah, our last two questions for the day is first is by Venkat. He says, "Will it be a good idea to enter e-learning sector with a small market, where other big players are not still concentrating?" Yeah, see, e-learning is a big opportunity, and e-learning is not yet in the realm of uh, intensely competitive space like web commerce. But nevertheless, e-learning is there everywhere. You scratch the surface of, of the internet and you see e-learning sites which are offering you free things. The idea is to figure out a sound business model. How are you going to earn your money? Are you going to earn your money by selling the courses? Are you going to earn your money by selling ad space? Are you going to earn your money by uh, maybe uh, selling to institutes or universities or schools? How are you going to do that? Now that is the uh, area where you must do it. Where is the money coming from? Because there are 50 different ways where you can earn money on e-learning. And it's not always on selling courses. It could be something else also. So think of that and get into a 
niche segment. What is the segment that you are addressing? What is the value proposition to the segment? Why should they come and pay you their hard earned money? Try and answer these questions. Then you will build a great product. And then get into the feature. So look at the non-product needs of the segment also. E-learning specifically has a lot of non-product needs. Yeah, I'm done. Any last question? Um, our last question for the day, Gurudas, is from Bibi Krishna. Yep. Yes. He says, how wise is it okay. to build a long-term profiting business for a building entrepreneur? Can we predict future promising product? Uh, can you predict future promising products? Most certainly you can and th there are thousands of examples in business space where entrepreneurs have been able to predict with uncanny accuracy whether a product will work in a market or not. Unfortunately, entrepreneurs of today are driven not by their imagination and their, uh, you know, how can I say, a sixth sense whether a product will work or not, their business sense, but they have been driven by the investor. And that is when I have a problem. If that investor is saying, don't invest in it, it's not going to make sense, I can understand that. I appreciate his experience. I appreciate that he's worked with a, a lot of failures and he's worked with a lot of successes. But somewhere you have a gut feeling where you know a small segment of customers intensely and you know this, this is bound to work. So get on with it. So I'm saying innovation is... Uh, is not a question which you ask your consumers or not a question which you ask your investors but it's something which you sense in the mind. You know a lot of these birds and animals can sense danger. We also can do that but we have stopped relying on our sensory perception and we have started relying more on technology and uh, our bias about what we have seen. So this is for me very important for an entrepreneur. I always say this to entrepreneurs. Don't be biased with what you know. That's going to pull you back. A great lot of businesses have uh, entered the, uh, you know, these opportunities without any kind of bias on their shoulders. Then they were not carrying the legacy of the bias. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Was that the last question? Yes. Thank you so much. The, the you. session was very interesting. Uh, thank you to all our attendees for participating in the webinar. Please do send in your feedbacks and suggestions to us at eclub at nenglobal.org. Also, if you found the session interesting, please feel free to blog or post about it on our Facebook page. The recorded version of the webinar will be available on our website, uh, on our YouTube channel actually, by the end of this week. NEN Entrepreneur Support and Training is conducting a one-day workshop for entrepreneurs on raising funds in Delhi. On July 13th, the details are up on nenonline.tv. Also, NEN is conducting an online mentoring clinic on scaling your food and beverage business on July 6th, that's Saturday, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. The details are up on NEN Online TV. Also, join us for our next webinar on Right Digital Marketing Mix for Startup by Aji Isaac, co-founder of TechShoe.com, on July 10th at 3 p.m. Thank you once again and have a nice evening. Thank you. Right, Sam. Yeah.